Hey everybody, welcome to today's presentation on Gray Literature. My name is Nicole and I'm one of the librarians with the Debra Tree Virtual Library and I'll be your presenter today. This session is being recorded. The recording as well as a copy of the slides will be shared with you after the presentation, probably within a day or two. If you have questions at any time, uh, there is a questions option in the GoToWebinar box, which depending on your setup is probably on the right hand side of your screen. Feel free to en enter in your questions at any time and we'll also have some dedicated time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions that anyone may have. So today's objectives. First off, we're going to discuss the WHA Virtual Library and its services for those of you who might not be familiar with us. We're going to talk about what great literature is and when you might want to use it. And then finally, we're going to go through different ways of locating and managing your great literature results. So the WHA Virtual Library provides access to electronic resources and library services for WHA staff, eligible community health agencies, and eligible personal care homes. If you're in one of these groups and you haven't yet received your access, please go to our website and there's information there about how you can get set up. We provide access to a wide range of electronic resources, and we also provide a number of library services. Those include literature searches, where we will actually do the research for you and provide you with a list of results on a topic of interest, document delivery for anything that we don't subscribe to, and then finally, education and training sessions like this one. So what is gray literature? Uh, according to the Third International Conference on Grey Literature, it is that which is produced on all levels of government, academics, business and industry in print and electronic formats, but which is not controlled by commercial publishers. Uh, this isn't the only definition that exists, there are others that are floating around out there, but this is a good one to start off with. So let's just break this down a little bit. So uh, Grey Literature can be produced by a wide variety of organizations. It can be government, it can be academic, it could be business. And it can be in print or it can be in electronic form. It may or may not be peer reviewed, but the, really the distinguishing factor of gray literature versus the so-called black literature, which is that produced by commercial publishers, is that gray literature is not uh, part of that traditional publishing model. So if you think about a journal article or a book, that's more the, the traditional model. Gray literature is all the stuff that doesn't fit into that category. And that covers a lot of things. So types of gray literature can include government documents, statistics, clinical trial registries, dissertations, tweets and other social media posts, working papers, policies, preprints, presentations, patents and regulations, as well as patient education materials and other electronic resources like blogs. It covers a whole variety of different publication types. So when you say you're searching gray literature, you might be interested in one of these, you might be interested in all of them, but there's really a, a great deal of variety out there of the type of material that you might find when you're talking about searching for gray literature. So why would you want to search for gray literature? Well, first off, not everything is in the traditional literature. Some topics aren't covered at all. Some may have more detail or different perspectives that are provided in the gray literature. If someone's written a thesis on a particular topic, that may provide more detail than an equivalent journal article, for example. Or you might get uh, perspectives from the practitioner or from the patient even that are not covered by the traditional literature. It's really a key resource for some kinds of research questions in particular. So for example, if you're looking at anything related to public policy, you're probably want to, going to want to look at the gray literature in addition to the traditional literature for your search. Also, if you're looking at developing a policy, you might look to the gray literature to find examples of uh, similar policies at other organizations or institutions. Gray literature is often used in knowledge synthesis projects like systematic reviews or scoping reviews because it can minimize some of the biases that are inherent in the publication process. Uh, those include things like uh, taking forever to get published or certain kinds of uh, research that is not necessarily published. For example, it can be a little bit challenging to get null results published. So if we looked at an intervention and found it did nothing, for example, that might not end up in a traditional journal article, but you might be able to find it in the gray literature. So that's why it's really highly recommended by uh, systematic reviewing related guidelines that you include gray literature in a systematic review search because it mitigates some of those biases of relying solely on the traditional literature. Gray literature is dynamic. 
as I mentioned, it can take quite a while to get something published in traditional channels. It could take months or even years sometimes to go through the publication process for an article or a book. Whereas if you look at a blog or another kind of document, I can post that on the web tomorrow and have it be available for sharing. And finally, there's the question of accessibility. Uh, that isn't just limited to financial accessibility uh, because sometimes gray literature might be behind a paywall, sometimes uh, traditional literature will be free, but it's also in terms of how available it is to the general public. Um, so if you're looking at a different sort of audience, for example, a, a patient education material provides the same information in many cases as traditional literature, but in a way that is more accessible to people without a medical background. You can also consider uh, whether a particular type of publication is accessible to different levels of government, is accessible to different people outside of those who have access to a library. So there's lots of considerations in terms of why gray literature might be useful for a particular search or a particular topic. However, there are some problems inherent to gray literature. First off, it can itself be biased. So if you have a blog, you have to understand it hasn't gone through a peer review process, and therefore some of the problems or biases inherent to that publication might not have been picked up. Um, other examples, because it doesn't go through a traditional peer review process, many different types of gray literature can have problems, and you need to be aware of these problems and be considering the critical appraisal processes for gray literature, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Another challenge is it can be ephemeral. So if you have a journal article that has a standardized identifier associated with it that's published by a reliable publisher and that is indexed in the number of databases, you can be fairly certain that you'll be able to find at least a record of that journal article in future. However, a tweet or a blog post or a paper posted on the internet somewhere is much easier to get rid of. And therefore, it's hard to keep track of gray literature in a way that is not necessarily true of traditional literature. And finally, gray literature can be tricky to find. And if you're in this presentation, that's probably the issue that you've come to address because uh, as in opposed to a traditional literature search where you look at PubMed and you find the journal articles, not all types of gray literature are necessarily in databases and they can be quite tricky to track down if you're not sure what you're doing. So that's what we're going to be covering over the next few slides. So in terms of appraising sources of gray literature, you can use a general critical appraisal technique, and we've had a webinar on that in the past that I definitely recommend you guys check out on our YouTube channel. There are also critical appraisal tools specifically for the gray literature. One example of that is AACODS, and that stands for Accuracy, Authority, Coverage, Objectivity, Date, and Significance. So what this checklist really refers to, and you can find a fuller version of it available online, is reviewing the document itself, as well as what information is available about its provenance, to try to understand whether you can trust this particular source for whatever it is that you're using it for. So you want to consider, is this particular gray literature source accurate? Does it reflect uh, your understanding of the topic area? Does it seem like it's appropriately cited when that's relevant? Does it seem like it's uh, from a proper authority? Do you know who wrote this thing or what organization put it out? And what sort of authority do they have to make claims about a particular topic area? Coverage is really about, does it cover the perspectives that it needs to? Does it provide information about both sides of the argument when that's relevant? Does it provide information about all the different facets of the topic where that's relevant? Objectivity is where we get into that question of bias. So is it clear that they're trying to sell you something or they're trying to convince you of a particular point of view? In which case, maybe this isn't a document that you can trust. Date, uh, is this up to date? Is it been recently published or recently reviewed? And do you know that it reflects the most recent literature on this topic where that's relevant? And finally, significance. Is this particular item relevant to the purpose for which you have sought it out? Because if it's not, even if it's the best document out there, it might not be one that you choose to use for your purposes. So then we get into where can you find gray literature? And really the first step in figuring out where to look is to determine what kind of literature are you looking for? 
So that can include what specific publication types might be relevant for your particular topic. It can also include which specific organizations or authors you might be interested in. If you're really only interested in what the Canadian Medical Association has to say about this topic, then you're probably better off going directly to their website and looking at what they say about this topic rather than going through a more comprehensive green literature search. Whereas if you're really not specifically interested in a particular organization, your search might be more wide ranging. And you also want to think about other restrictions that might be on your search. So for example, if you're interested in policies, but you're really only interested in Canadian examples of policies, that will guide where and how you search for grey literature. So the first place that you can look for a broad search of grey literature is actually in our library search. So from the library web page up at the top right hand corner of the screen, there is a search bar where you can search through all of our online collections. And over on the left hand side of the results screen that you will get for your search, you will see this big long list of content types. Now some of these you will see are from the traditional literature. So for example, an article is typically a journal article, but others of these will reflect gray literature source types. So for example, on this list, we see dissertations, data sets, government documents, market research. All of these are examples of gray literature. Not everything will be in this database because not everything is in databases, period. But this is a good starting point if you're not sure what kind of literature might exist on your topic. Another good general resource is the Cadith Gray Matters Checklist. So this is a tool that is geared towards systematic review type searching. But really what it provides is a very extensive list of potential sources of gray literature broken down by type or topic area, as well as by country in a lot of cases. So for example, they have an extensive list of where you might find health technology assessment resources, broken down by international versus Canadian versus American versus any number of other countries. So I would definitely recommend this as a resource if you're particularly focused on systematic review type gray literature searching, but also as a general resource to give you an idea of all the different variety of potential places to look that exists out there. Then we have the Google search. Now, if you search Google with just a general keyword, you will get a heck of a lot of content, some of which may be relevant and some of which may not. But really what you wanna do when you're thinking about searching for gray literature is thinking about how you can narrow down your search. One way you can do that is by being more specific in the keywords that you use to search. So rather than just pneumonia, for example, I could search for hospital acquired pneumonia or pediatric pneumonia or any number of other topics that I might be specifically interested in. But the other way that you can narrow things down a bit is with the special Google features that you see on your screen here. So you, for example, you can limit your search to the title of an item. If I'm interested in policies, I would often find that they would have policy in the title and therefore in title colon policy will help me to locate those. Certain types of gray literature will tend to be published in particular formats. So I can use that ext colon um, option to narrow that down. So for example, I could look for a PDF, I could look for an Excel document, I could look for a PowerPoint. Again, it depends on what specific type of gray literature I might be interested in. And finally, you've got to the site option. So you can use this to narrow down by a general domain. So for example, here you see site colon dot CA to look for Canadian specific results. But you can also use this option to search specific websites if they don't have a very good internal search. So for example, if I search for site colon WHA.mb.ca, I would get all the results that appear anywhere on the WHA website for my topic. So that's a way that you can narrow down your search using Google. We do have a more extensive webinar on Google that I would definitely recommend checking out in our archives if you want to learn more about how you would approach uh, narrowing down your Google search. But that's just some general principles to keep in mind. Now we get into specific types of gray literature and where you might look for them. So if you're interested in trial registries, there are a number of different registry platforms that you could consider searching. These are three of the most common. Clinicaltrials.gov is run by the US government, but it actually contains trials from many locations around the world. Um, similarly, Health Canada has Canadian trials and the WHO ICTRP, again, has trials from around the world. So what these registries tend to include is 
planned, current, and past uh, trials. So it can include ones that have since been published, and often it will include a link to the publication, but it can also make you aware of trials that are either recruiting or ongoing that may have interim results or may have more information about the approach that they're taking to a particular topic and so that now that might be of interest to you depending on your topic area if you're talking about dissertations there are again a number of different places that we can look this is just a set of examples uh, so the oatd.org, Theses Canada, and search.ndltd.org are all examples of different uh, search databases specific to dissertations and theses. Uh, you can also look at a specific university repository. So, for example, the University of Manitoba has the MSpace repository where uh, University of Manitoba graduate students deposit their theses and dissertations. And there's a link there to a list of all the different Canadian university repositories. So, once we have the slides sent out to you, you can click on that and take a look through that list to see what is available. The other option you have for looking at theses and dissertations is Google Scholar because a lot of those repositories will be indexed there. Uh, you just want to be careful with Google Scholar that you're aware of the limitations it has in terms of finding specifically theses and dissertations because it doesn't have a filter for those options. So you need to get a little bit creative in what sort of keywords you use to locate theses through that search portal. Data and reports. Uh, so the number one source here for Canadian data specifically will be the CAIHI database or Statistics Canada, depending on your area of interest. CAIHI will have more medical focused data, whereas StatsCan will have things like demographic data. Uh, CDC Wonder and publications.gc.ca are both examples of repositories of government reports. Uh, the first is American and the second is Canadian. So that would be a great source for that sort of information. And if you're interested in reports from other countries, many other countries will have a similar site that uh, lists them or otherwise provides access to resources that you can use to find government reports from other countries. Some of the provinces have them. It's kind of variable, variable depending on where you want to look but that would be as a good starting point for you if you're looking specifically for this kind of great literature. Guidelines, uh, we have had a, a webinar specifically on locating guidelines. Again, feel free to check that out if this is a particular topic of interest. But our number one recommendation for guidelines would be TRIP database, which indexes guidelines from many different countries around the world, as well as the CMA Infobase, which is a Canadian specific resource. And our practice guidelines toolkit lists a number of other specific places to look for practice guidelines. Preprints is a bit of an interesting topic. So preprint, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, is a journal article to be. It's an article that hasn't gone through the whole publication process yet, but is intending to go through that process in future. Uh, so as with other types of gray literature, this preprint uh, typically has not yet gone through peer review, so just be aware of that when you're considering whether it will be appropriate for you to rely on that as a source. But there are many different places that you can look for preprints. There's a number of different topic-specific preprint repositories, so MedArchive for medical information, SciArchive for psychology-related, BioArchive for biology, then there's a number of different others for different topic areas. There are also general preprint repositories like Authoria that look at um, multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary topics, so that's a good general resource to search. And then you also have platforms like Open Science Fra Framework or Figshare. These are not specific to preprints, but they do end up hosting a lot of preprints. These are more uh, general research output from various different academics and scientists. So it's not specific to preprints, but there is a lot of other types of gray literature that can be found on those sites as well. So once you have found your gray literature, it's important to also consider how you're going to manage it. What I generally recommend for that is using a Citation Manager plugin or bookmarklet. Unlike doing a traditional database search where you can often download a list of citations or a, a bibliographic management file directly from the database, oftentimes gray literature sources won't have that. So the real advantage of these bookmarklets or plugins whether that's the Zotero one pictured here or Mendeley and a, a number of other sources also have their own, is a lot of them will actually take a snapshot of the resource for you and or save a copy of the resource for you within 
the citation manager itself. So that can be really helpful when you're thinking about, oh, what if this source disappears in future? What if I can't find it again? This can help you both keep track of the sources themselves, but also have a record of what they looked like and what they said, just in case they should happen to disappear in future. There are other techniques you can do if you just note down the URL, like you could look for an online archive of a, of a particular site, but this is a really easy and time efficient way of both managing the citations and also preventing against that ephemeral problem uh, with gray literature. So that brings us to the end of the presentation for today and uh, I'm happy to answer questions if anyone might have any. Uh, please feel free to enter them in the chat box and I will stick around for a few minutes just to see if anybody has any questions. And if not, uh, remember that this presentation will be shared with you including both the recording and the slides as soon as they become available. So keep an eye out for that in your email. And I would encourage you to also to sign up for our future webinars. That we have them on a variety of topics. And if there are any that you don't see on our list that you would like to see in future, please feel free to let us know that as well.